you very much and good evening. Thanks for coming out. The audible version, the audible version of Health Attitude is nine hours long to listen to it. And I don't have nine hours to tell you about the book. So I'm going to really have to hit the wave tops. It all started when I left IBM after 35 years, 14 years ago, and I joined a number of boards at that time, for-profit and not-for-profit. One of those boards was right here in this building, Danbury Hospital. This was quite an eye-opener for me. I saw two different worlds. On the one hand, I saw Danbury Hospital, founded in 1885, a caring hospital, roots deeply into the community, a fantastic set of clinicians, nurses that really care about the patients, a great management team, just a, a, a wonderful environment, saving lives, just, just, I can't say enough good things about Danbury Hospital. But then there was this other world that I saw by being on the board, and that was the world of healthcare at large, the healthcare system. And I was quite amazed, actually, that the hospital could get anything done working within this system, a world of paper and faxes and post-its, a lingua franca that's really the fax machine. And having come from the world of the internet, it was really stunning. I guess maybe appalling might be a better word. And so I thought, I need to really dig in and learn what healthcare is all about. So I went back to school and I studied healthcare for three and a half years and did a research study here at the hospital, wrote a dissertation, and earned my doctorate in health administration uh, at the ripe age of 69. Then I decided to write this book. The goal in writing the book is pretty simple. I wanna get people thinking about healthcare beyond themselves. I wanna get patients and providers and payers and politicians to think about healthcare and what works and what doesn't work. I must say that in my research for the book, I found that the problems were actually bigger than I expected, but I found that the solutions were closer at hand than I had expected. So what are the problems with our healthcare system? Well, I know I could go around the room and each of you would have two or three or four problems that you could cite, and it's hard to say what's most important, but I would have to say the biggest problem in the American healthcare system starts with a C, cost. It is very, very costly to provide health care to a subset of the population in this country. Why is it so costly? Well, there are many reasons. It's not a, there's not a simple answer. It's not just, well, prices are too high. It's, there's a lot of factors that go into this. Fraud runs right now almost $60 billion. That's, that's a lot. Beyond that, we have unnecessary tests and procedures. We've all experienced that in one way or another. Estimates of the cost of unnecessary tests and procedures range from a half a trillion dollars, which by the way would cover the health care of all the 45 million people who are not insured in any way. Most of the estimates actually are closer to a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars of unnecessary tests and procedures. So when you look at the cost per person of health care in America, it's roughly double that of other countries. I always thought other countries couldn't possibly have health care like America. When I was young, my parents would travel to Europe and I, my brothers and I would say, oh, geez, I hope nothing happens to them while they're over there and need some kind of medical care. I feel quite differently about that today. And I must say that our outcomes, while miracles are performed every day in America, there are outcomes that are not always as good as they could be. There are medical errors that happen, of course. There are a lot of things that can be and need to be improved. And then we have electronic health records. This could be the topic for the entire evening. Electronic health records are necessary but not sufficient. We can't live without them, but frankly, we're having trouble living with them. A lot of controversy surrounds this, and I'm sure you'll have questions about it. But I can assure you that we need them in the long term. We just need them to be different than the way they are right now. And then lastly, in the problem category, we have big pharma with a 
1,500 person cadre of lobbyists, the largest lobbying group by far compared to any other industry. Prices are rising, as you probably have read. We have drugs on the market that cost $100,000. It will extend your life by four to six weeks. We, there's a whole lot to say about big pharma and the impact it has on the cost of our healthcare system. So what about the solutions? The book is about a third about problems and two thirds about solutions, and there are many. I group them into three categories, attitude, technology, and policy. And there isn't time to go into a lot of detail, but I'd like to give you some examples. In the category of attitude, this is something that all of us need to change. There's an attitude fix needed for each of the four Ps that I mentioned, patients, payers, providers, and politicians. For patients, we need to take more responsibility for our health. I remember my mother, in all her years, she revered the doctor, who deserved to be revered, but she never challenged or even questioned and asked, what, Mom, what's that green pill you're taking? I don't know. Well, what's it for? I don't know that either. Doctor told me to take it. That approach doesn't work in the going forward model. And fortunately, technology is going to help us in being a consumer-led revolution in healthcare because of the technology. Attitudes of physicians are already changing dramatically. They're gonna change a lot more, and this is because of the nature of the incentive system. This is one of the key problems, frankly, is the motivations are backwards. The system we have compensates for sickness, not for health. It compensates for the number of things we do, not how well we do them, and what the results are, are produced from those things that we do. Payers, need to change their attitude also and participate more broadly in cost savings and provide motivations to achieve those cost savings. And politicians, the list of their attitude changes needed is very, very long. No time for that one. Technology, I need to say a few things about, especially for DACs. You know, one of the things that's most amazing about what's going on in healthcare is this little device we carry around with us. Some of you may be old enough to remember Seymour Cray, a famous, brilliant engineer who developed the world's first supercomputer. It was called the Cray-1 supercomputer. It would barely fit in this room. It cost $5 million. It weighed five tons. It had no apps, couldn't make a phone call or even play a game. But Scientists loved it. For the first time, they now had something that allowed them to perform simulations where they could model hurricanes and nuclear weapons tests and so many other phenomena in the world of engineering. It was great. Well, as powerful as it was, this little guy right here is at least 150 times more powerful than that first supercomputer, 150 times more powerful. So we're all walking around with supercomputers. I coined a new term in the book called PSC, the personal supercomputer. Now what does it mean to have a personal supercomputer? What does it mean with regard to health? Well, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Of course, there's a processor chip in this, a computer chip, as, as we know, but there's another chip in there you might not know about. It's called the M8. It's a motion coprocessor. The M8 motion coprocessor knows if it's moving, and it knows what direction it's moving, and how fast it's moving, and it knows the latitude and longitude, it knows your posture, it knows a lot about your movement, if you want it to. And in this phone, in all Apple phones, and I admit I'm a little biased toward Apple, there's an app called Health, just simply Health. You can't remove it. It's part of the phone. It's like the calendar and mail and contacts. It's, you can't get rid of it. What does it do? Well, it's basically just a database that stores information that comes from apps. Right now, there are 900 apps that can feed data into that database. So for example, if you're counting your steps while you're running or jogging, well, it counts those and puts them in the database. But there are attachments available for this phone. For example, there's one it fits over the camera, which is dramatically more powerful than cameras of the past as well. And it has a little slot in it. And you take a strip, you put a drop of blood on the strip, you put the strip in the slot, you push the button, and the camera takes this incredibly detailed picture, and then a colorimetric supercomputer analysis is performed in your PSC, and it reveals in seconds your cholesterol. 
This is going to lead to tests of all forms that we can imagine. The FDA, who you might think would have some reservations about this, has now approved almost 200 different devices going along with apps associated with the phone. So now we have all this data going into the health. So now what happens? Well, of course, we can look at it. We can email it to a physician. But at Cedar sinai Hospital last week, they announced that they have modified their electronic health record system to integrate with the health app for 80,000 patients. So now, when any activity occurs health-related, that activity goes into the database and is available in the EHR. So what does that mean? That means a cardiologist, for example, who is following a particular patient can look at that data and see how you're doing, what your activity level is, what your heart rate is. This contrasts with the prior approach, well, come back and see me in 30 days and we'll see how things look. No, it's a continuous analysis. Well, the cardiologist doesn't have time to continuously look at this information, of course, but the computer can look at it for the cardiologist and generate alerts to say, Mrs. Smith's arrhythmia seems to be changing and better give her a call and see what's going on. That is just one of so many examples. Another one fits on here, it's called a celescope. A mother puts it in the baby's ear or a father, takes a picture and determines if the child has an ear infection. Another one called a live core has two sensors on the, each side of the back of the iPhone. You hold it like this, you push the button, and you get a 30, 30 second EKG. Now, is that the same as a 15 lead EKG? No. But is it helpful potentially for chronically ill patients and others that are interested in their heart condition? Of course. So we are at the beginning of the dawn of self-diagnosis. And I know as I say that, doctors in the audience that I know are squirming. Self-diagnosis leads to self-prescribing, which leads to self-destruction. However, we know that this technology actually can be helpful and actually improve the productivity of doctors. Just one example is Isabel. Isabel is a technology called differential diagnostics, where you take your app and you put in male or female, how old you are, what part of the world you live in, and then you put in all the symptoms you can think of. My left foot hurts, I have a headache, my this, that, the other, all the symptoms you can think of, you put them in, you hit the button, and, and you get a list, probability sequenced of likely diagnoses that you're facing. Now, what do you think the average accuracy of a physician's diagnosis would be? Well, I know some, I don't know any doctors that would say 100%. I know some that cynically would say 50%. I think most would probably say 75 to 95%, somewhere in that range. A peer-reviewed study of a large number of patients using Isabel found that the diagnosis was 96% accurate. But the point is not to eliminate the doctor, the point is to leverage the capability of the doctor. So instead of coming in with a printout from the internet and saying, dear doctor, please explain all this to me, the patient comes in with some thoughtful analysis and thoughtful input about their condition that provides value add and productivity boost for the doctor, and many for that reason are embracing it. So that's just one simple example. In the world of 3D printing, it's just phenomenal what's happening at centers like Wake Forest and, and University of Michigan and other places that are using 3D printing to save lives. Think of a Let's think, let's think a little far out, a liver. Now, they can't print a liver just yet. They claim they're going to be able to, but I think we're going to have a wait. But livers, the liver, as you know, is the second largest organ of our body. It doesn't just collapse. It fails in areas of the liver. Experiments are underway right now to print a scaffold. Look, I think of it like a little truss, of a little bridge, and then print in between the openings in that scaffold using stem cells of the patient. And these are called pluripotent stem cells. And then take that tissue that is printed and insert it into the liver. The hydrogel dissolves into the body and those cells become liver cells. This is called regenerative medicine. This is a whole new field that didn't exist until recently because of the advent of 3D printing. And then we have the whole area of big data and analytics to look at population health. In a simple phrase, I, I could say that the future of healthcare is population health. 
Today, we look at one patient at a time. We have a lot of data about a lot of patients, but we don't have any incentive, any motivation to look at them collectively as a population. Well, this is changing in a dramatic way through something called accountable care. You'll see the term, if you haven't heard from your doctor already, you will, when you get a letter saying that we've decided that we are now participating in an accountable care organization. What this means is that instead of being paid on a transaction by transaction basis, which we, we call volume, they're paid on a value basis. And the value is determined by the payer. It could be Medicare, it might be Aetna, and they might say it's $319.70 per month per person who are 65 years or older in Danbury, as an example. And this changes attitudes. Now, there, have, there has been a lot of resistance to this idea. There have been some hospital systems that have embraced it and lost a lot of money. But there are others that are making money. Well-managed hospitals, like this one, will make money on the ACO concept. And this hospital is embracing the concept of the ACO. And this is a real game changer. Right now, there are three and a half million patients in America that are under this form of care. And under that model, their, their cost is $400 less, but more importantly, it's changed the model. It's broken the old way of doing things into a new way. There are a lot of complications, just like with EHR, and you have to read more about that in, in the book. So that's an overview of just a, a few things that are going on in healthcare. You'll have a chance to ask about more with our panel, and we have a very distinguished panel.